You're listening to the Finchwood Discipleship Podcast. My name is Matthew, and as your host, my mission is to help you discover who God is and what it means to live as a citizen of His kingdom. Greetings, Finchwood listeners. Once again, it is very good to be back making this podcast, and honestly, that's something that I'd like to talk about a bit before we get into today's episode about spiritual gifts. My goal for this podcast is to reach as many people as I can, but that means I need your help in getting the word out. The number one way that people generally find out about a new podcast is through word of mouth, so if you know anyone who's trying to follow Jesus or who has questions about God, please tell them about Finchwood. If you're able, I would even ask you to do that right now. Send them a link, recommend a specific episode if you know what they're currently wrestling with. If they're mad at you afterward, though I really don't think it's going to come to that, I give you full permission to blame me. Thank you in advance, by the way, and now back to the topic at hand, we are talking about spiritual gifts. That means first we're going to take a quick look at what we mean by spiritual gifts and what they're generally for. This is a topic that we touched on briefly back in Season 2, Episode 6, which was called Empowerment. At that time, we talked about how the church, the fellowship that consists of every follower of Jesus throughout all of time and space, is like an organism with different parts performing different functions based on both their design and the needs of the body as a whole. In our physical human bodies, we have a variety of organs. We have a brain for thinking, a stomach for taking in nutrients for food, a heart to keep our blood circulating, and so forth. And the body of the church is the same way. Different people are suited to different functions by design, and God is the one who ultimately plans that out and makes it happen, in order to provide for the needs of his people. By the way, this analogy of the church as a body with different parts isn't something I made up all by myself. I'm pretty much lifting it directly from the book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. In chapter 12 of that letter, the Apostle Paul explains that God has arranged us as a body, that he has decided which gift, or rather I should say gifts plural, each person should possess. And then he goes on later in the same chapter to list some of what those gifts might be. Later on in this episode, we're going to look at that list and a few others that the Bible gives us, but there's something even more important that Paul was trying to get at in his letter to the church in Corinth all those centuries ago. You see, the Corinthians were concerned, and I would even say obsessed, with comparing themselves to each other. For them, everything was a competition, which isn't at all surprising considering that their city held their own miniature version of the Olympics every two years. They called them the Isthmian Games, and that competitive mindset seems to have worked its way into their fellowship, to the point that they divided up in two teams. There was fierce competition between those who were Team Peter, or Team Paul, or Team Apollos, and Paul basically wrote this whole letter to tell them that this is stupid. You guys are all supposed to be Team Jesus, why are you like this? But even beyond loyalties to individual apostles, there was a lot of concern about who were the most important members of their community. Was it the miracle workers, or maybe the prophets? Who gets to stand on the pedestal, get the trophy, and win the applause and adoration of the rest of the church? And most importantly, it's it's me, right? That's the most important guy, It's, it's me. They would compete to see who could win the title of the loudest, most exuberant, most gifted worshiper. They each wanted to have the most excellent gift, whatever that is. And of course, Paul wants none of this. By the time he gets to chapter 12 of this letter, he's teaching that the parts we give the least honor to are actually the most important. Yes, you need your eyes and your ears, but have you ever considered how important your big toe is? Without it, you can't even stand properly, and yet nobody wants to be the church's version of the big toe, or the butthole, or the pancreas. Those are precious parts that I don't think about very often, but they're critically important for not only my quality of life, but my ability to function and do useful things. So similarly, in the church, we all want the flashy jobs that are visible, that everyone notices, the roles that everyone's going to see and hear. And yet God says through Paul, that there's something even more excellent that's available to us. To that point, the Apostle spends the entire next chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, explaining that 
love is more important than any other gift. That we could have perfect knowledge and perform great miracles, but without love, it would all be meaningless. Now, love, as I'm talking about it here, is more than just feeling good that another person is around or admiring them. It's more a lifestyle of choosing to put the needs and desires of others over your own needs and desires. It's about serving other people, and that's really what we're looking at today. These gifts that we're going to talk about exist for the purpose of serving one another and placing others before ourselves. The current season that this podcast is going through, by the way, has been all about spiritual disciplines, ways that we can grow as Christians and become more like Jesus. Serving others is one of the oldest and most profound ways that we can do that. After all, it's what Jesus did. He said that he came to serve and to give his life and not to be served like all the other kings of the earth. And he commanded us to live the same way. The love that God is talking about, the love that he commands his people to display to one another, is self-sacrificial. It's more concerned with giving than it is with taking. We've talked about that before a couple of times, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it again. But that's the short version of love as a biblical concept, and it's what we need to keep in mind today as we talk about spiritual gifts, along with the fact that a gift by definition is something that you didn't earn. It's not a trophy to be displayed for your own pride. It's not something that you win. Instead, it's something that's given to you by God because he's generous and because he cares about the people around you. That's the heart, and those are the principles behind today's topic. So what kinds of gifts does God give his people so that they can serve one another? There are some very spiritual-sounding answers that I could give you for that question. But of course, there's always the more obvious, less spiritual-sounding answer, that all of us have talents and skills that can be used to help someone else. If you're good at accounting or baking, I promise you there's always a time and a place for you to use those skills to serve other people. What's nice is that the Bible contains at least five different lists of spiritual gifts, and none of them are identical. Some of the items listed in those scriptures are as simple and natural as having organization skills, encouraging others, and generally helping out when there's work to be done. One gift is even the very thing that we talked about in the last episode. Extraordinary generosity is listed as a spiritual gift that some people have in abundance. Some gifts are controversial and hard to explain, like speaking in tongues. Finally, there are a few oddball gifts that are mentioned elsewhere in Scripture without being part of any organized list at all, and those are intercession, celibacy, hospitality, and artistic skills or craftsmanship. Now, regarding these lists, lots of people over the years have tried to find some kind of meaning behind why they're all different from each other, like restricting one list to become things that can only happen during a church meeting, while they would interpret another list as a Christianized version of those clickbait personality tests that pop up on social media. Now, I used to go along with some of those schemes, but lately I've been starting to think that the lists are all different because there is no comprehensive list. The gifts God gives us are every bit as diverse as we are. No two of us are the same, and even if we find that two people's gifts are similar and could be named with the same biblical-sounding word, the fact remains that those two people are going to express and use that gift in ways that are completely different. It's also worth mentioning that the Bible never says that we can only have one gift. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the same Holy Spirit living in you that the rest of us do, and he can choose to work through you in any way or ways that he likes. I've never met a Christian who was only good at one thing, or who wasn't called to serve God's people in multiple arenas. Especially as we get older, we usually find that different gifts have been expressed in different ways during different seasons of our lives, and, of course, the many ways that multiple gifts can be combined adds even more diversity to the situation. With all of that being said, it's also pretty clear that there's no one person who's expected to have every gift which is why it's so important for us to recognize that pastors and other figureheads within the church are just human beings like the rest of us, and they can't do all the work by themselves. In fact, that's why God gives us all of these gifts, because he expects us to help in that work and bear some of the load. Finally, other than perhaps love, which is the exception to every rule, there's no one gift that the Bible says everybody will have. Paul mentions that in the same chapter that we've been talking about. Starting in verse 29, he says, 
Is everybody an apostle, or a prophet, or a teacher? Does everybody work miracles, or does everyone speak in tongues? And the answer that's anticipated by all of those rhetorical questions is, no, of course not. Everybody has different gifts, because we're all different parts of the body. The goal, then, is for each of us to figure out, what has God specifically gifted me to do? And how can I use that for the benefit of others? However, the goal here isn't just to present you with the official list of 20 or so gifts that the Bible explicitly mentions, thereby implying that these are the only ways God can work in your life to serve others. Instead, the lists given to us by the authors of Scripture are merely broad categories designed to give us a starting point for self-discovery. So let's start with the suggestions mentioned by the apostles and prophets who came before us. The foremost chapter that Christians usually visit when we talk about spiritual gifts is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the same chapter that I've been talking about, in which Paul is dealing with the Corinthian Christian's desire for fame and renown. In it, Paul lists nine gifts which cover an impressive spectrum of service opportunities inside and outside the church. He says to some people God might give an unusual degree of wisdom, faith, or knowledge, Some might receive power to miraculously heal diseases or to perform miracles. To some, he could reveal mysteries through prophetic insight or give them the ability to distinguish between good and evil spirits. And finally, some might receive the gift of speaking in other languages and or the ability to interpret those same languages. Formally, those are the nine gifts that Paul mentions in quick succession in that chapter. But I should add that further down the same page, he also mentions a few other gifts as if they're equally valid. He repeats some and then he adds teaching as well as the ability to organize things or lead others. And so really we have a total of 12 gifts mentioned here in this chapter. There's a similar list to be found in Romans chapter 12, where Paul again encourages believers to serve God and serve one another using whatever gifting they have to the best of their ability. And that time he lists seven of them, prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement, generosity, leadership, and mercy. Now, you probably already noticed that there's a lot of overlap between this list and the previous ones. And once again, I think that's on purpose. In this context, Paul's goal isn't to list every possible gift, but rather to give you a taste of what you might have to offer others. His instruction here is simple. Whatever gift God has given you, use it well and use it to benefit those around you. Next, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, this is a very short list. It consists of only two gifts, speaking and serving. Obviously, there's no new material here in 1 Peter, but it's worth mentioning because I think it sums up the possibilities rather nicely. Of all the ways that God can equip you, some are more public, some are more private. Some are based in words, and some are more based in actions, and so forth. But all of them come from the same God. And yet again, we're expected and encouraged to use them to the best of our ability. You can probably see a pattern developing along those lines. The final two lists that I'd like to look at take this concept in slightly different directions. Second to last, we have the one in Isaiah chapter 11. Now, a lot of people leave this list out of the conversation because it's in the Old Testament. But I'd like to remind all of us that the same Spirit of God exists in both the Old and New Testaments. So these gifts are well within the expectations and experience of the New Testament church. Here the emphasis isn't so much on the gifts as they are on the giver, that the Holy Spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And when any of us expresses those qualities as they're given to us, we can thank him as the source. The last list I want to look at today is found in Ephesians chapter 4. This one is a bit different from all the others because instead of mentioning actions or skills that individual people could receive in order to serve others, here we see specific people being listed as gifts given to the church. These are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And by the way, because of the grammar in the original Greek, sometimes people will mix those last two into a single gift, the pastor-teacher role. And I'm okay with that, but you could also interpret them separately. If you put all those lists together, you get a thorough sampling of what God might want to accomplish through you. The point here is that all of us have received gifts from God. 
And as you try to figure out how you can serve the church, go over these lists and see if any of the words stick out or resonate with you. There are also a number of online tests and websites you can go to to figure out where you might shine the brightest. But I would advise you to take those results with a grain of salt. Ultimately, only God gets to tell you what gifts you do or don't have. If all the lists and websites don't give you any good ideas, my advice is to simply ask yourself what you're passionate about, what you're naturally very good at, and what activities make you feel the most alive like you have a sense of purpose. The answers to those questions are probably related to the gifts that God has placed inside of you so that you can be a good gift to those around you. Your job is simply to find them and to cultivate them to the best of your ability. And that brings us to the last section of today's episode, in which we ask the most practical question, once you figure out your gifts, where are you supposed to use them? How do you put these God-given talents and abilities into practice? As we start to answer those questions, first I want to focus on that word practice, because there is a learning curve here. A prophet has to learn through experience, over time, how to differentiate between God's voice and their own imagination. A giver, just like we talked about two weeks ago, has to learn not only what to give, but where and how to maximize the impact of that gift. This, by the way, is why the Bible cautions against giving authority to new believers prematurely, because they haven't developed that decision-making ability yet of knowing when and how to apply their gifts the correct way. And it's also why the Bible encourages all of us to use our gifts under the oversight and leadership of other Christians. There is immense wisdom to be found in a group of people who all love God and who want to serve Him, and none of us is as smart as all of us. I should also reiterate within this section of the episode that each of us has multiple spiritual gifts. So even if you found one thing that you're good at, that doesn't mean you don't have more of value to offer. When you discover a second gift or a third, Look for common ground between them, or look for places where you can use both at the same time. A great example of this is what I'm doing right now. I am a teacher at heart. Like the intro to every episode says, my mission is to help people know who God is and how to live as a citizen of his kingdom. Any activity that pursues those goals is one where I can feel incredibly alive and useful, and that feels really good. So I use my teaching gift to make this podcast but I also use it in other places. I lead Bible study courses at my church, and sometimes I preach at our Wednesday night service. All of those activities fit into my lifestyle of service as a teacher of the Bible, but another thing that I'd like to think I'm reasonably good at is recording and editing sound, so the podcast in particular is at the intersection of two of my gifts. Alongside all of that, I'm also a pretty good cook, so when we host our small group, I like to provide nourishment for their stomachs as well as their spirits. Like me, you probably have multiple areas where you're skilled. Use those skills, together or separately, to help others. By the way, one thing you may or may not know is that none of the teaching outlets I just mentioned are how I make a living. I don't have any kind of title at my church, but I still find places to use my gift. There is a very common misconception in the church that ministry which, by the way, is more or less just the Latin word for serving, is something that only professionals can do. To the contrary, it's something that all of us can do. And you don't have to be a professional minister or pastor or whatever other title you can think of to do something useful for God in your community. In fact, I would go so far, once again, as to say that the vast majority of the work in any given church is supposed to be done by someone other than the pastor. They can't do it all themselves. I'm not against having pastors and deacons and bishops and all those other titles, by the way. It's great that we have individuals who are appointed to do special work within the church. I have a lot of respect for people who can dedicate their lives to serving God full-time in that way, and I'm glad we have structures in place to make the most of their wonderful efforts. But most of us are not called to be that. We're called to work regular jobs and to still find ways to fit service into our lives. My current paycheck comes from a warehouse that I work at where I keep track of a bunch of paper and envelopes. It's not spiritual-sounding work, but it's an honest living. 
It pays the bills so that I'm able to do all the other things that I do, like making this podcast. Not only do you not have to have a title to serve, but you also don't have to have a degree. I do happen to have a master's degree in this stuff, but I could have made this same podcast without the benefits of higher education. In short, whatever you think disqualifies you from using your gifts is a lie. You are qualified because God qualifies you by giving you these gifts in the first place. As we close out this episode, that leaves the usual questions of where, when, and how. And if you've listened to the previous episode, you probably know what I'm going to say here. That all of our lives are different, that all of our expressions of these gifts are going to be different, and so the best thing you can do is ask God for wisdom. He is the expert on how he made us. He gave us these gifts in the first place. So if you want to know where to use the amazing potential that lives inside of you, don't wait until you're frustrated and burnt out from doing everything under the sun that isn't designed for you. No, start by asking God to use you. Offer your gifts to him as an offering and ask him for guidance on where they can be applied the best. And you may be surprised by what he says. For the longest time, I thought I was supposed to be a pastor. And then over a long period of self-discovery, I learned that I'm actually called to do this and things like this. And that realization lifted this immense burden off of my shoulders because I was trying to fit myself into a professional minister mold that I didn't really belong in. Or at least I don't belong in it yet. God may change that one day, I don't know. Speaking of burnout, learn to recognize it as a warning sign that you're probably doing something you weren't designed for, or you're taking on specific ministry tasks that aren't yours to take on. When you notice burnout happening, take a step back and simplify the ministry burdens that are on your plate. Keep the ones that make you feel alive where you really feel useful, but don't feel guilty about letting go of the ones that don't. You may actually be doing someone else a favor because perhaps they've been looking for that ministry opportunity that makes them feel most alive but they couldn't step into it until you stepped out. There is so much more that I could talk to you about today within this broader topic of spiritual gifts and service. If you have questions about specific gifts from those five lists in the Bible, or any other questions for that matter, you know what to do. Drop me a line using the information found in the description of this episode. Meanwhile, I will be going a bit deeper into one specific gift next time, and that is the gift of leadership. We're going to take a good look at what leadership looks like within Christianity, what it should look like, and what it means to truly lead well as a Christian who is following Jesus. So, I will see you then. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Finchwood Discipleship Podcast, conversations for people who want to be more like Jesus. If you enjoyed this episode, then please subscribe now and consider sharing it with your friends. For more information about this episode's topic or to continue the discussion, please consult the show notes. See you next time.